My name is Jeff Johnson. I am the chief curator for a platform called Men Thrive, focusing on the mental wealth uh, and health and health of, of black men. And I'm a proud member of the African American Philanthropic Committee um, for the Cleveland Foundation. Uh, but more than that, I'm excited to enter us into uh, this moment with our speaker, uh, Valicia Butterfield Jones. And what I'm most excited about is even as she has taken on a new role at the Recording Academy, uh, leading their efforts in a real way to navigate what diversity and inclusion and equity looks like, uh, following an incredible uh, period of time at Google as the global head of inclusion, um, Valicia has been just an unbelievable force uh, working for the Obama campaign uh, for youth outreach and creating an organization called Women in Entertainment Empowerment Network, uh, which for over a decade now <clears throat> has engaged not only women professionals, but has also engaged young women interested in going into the industry, um, tackling not only pipeline issues, but also policy issues. She's more than that. Uh, she has been actively involved when the cameras are not on uh, and behind the scenes on policy issues around the country. Uh, she works with a number of us around the country to ensure that our voices are heard in places that often we don't believe anybody is even there. And if that wasn't enough, I think what I'm most inspired by is who Valicia is as a wife and, and a mother of two sons um, and how she doesn't balance, but she creates what almost seems like an effortless presence of excellence in all of the places that she shows up. Uh, and so I'm not only honored to introduce her to you, uh, but I'm honored to call her a friend. And so I'm excited about her remarks and even more excited about our opportunity to engage after those remarks. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you would give a virtual hand clap, uh, you know, you can even give a real one, even though nobody's going to hear you. We'll know that you're doing it uh, to Valicia Butterfields Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, um, for just being such an amazing friend over the years. I think we go back almost 20 wow. years, a long time. <laughs> and so I just want to thank you for that introduction um, and for just being um, a, a great brother who does the work again, as you mentioned before, when no one's watching. And so just thank you for that. I also want to just begin um, with a moment of thanks and gratitude uh, to the Cleveland Foundation for this warm invitation to Ron Richard, to Terry Eason, Alicia and the entire team. Um, just thank you for your diligence and being so innovative um, during a very difficult time in our world history. So I just want to acknowledge that and say that we see you and we thank you and we appreciate you for keeping the light on um, and keeping this program on uh, track. Um, I also want to, of course, thank the sponsors for this event and your board of directors and uh, your event co-chair. Uh, we know this work doesn't happen without your support. And so thank you for uh, the consistency and thank you for continuing uh, to invest in such a critical event and program during such a critical time. Um, it's so important that partners like you um, are involved. And so we want to acknowledge that also. And I think it's important, as I started to even unpack the theme of this event, and I was inspired and struck by uh, disrupting the cultural landscape through philanthropy. And it's not missed on me that in this moment in time in our world history is Ron so eloquently describe uh, that we're in a crisis. We're in a crisis and it's a human um, issue uh, that I think we're all grappling with right now. I, I can't speak for everyone, but I know I've had trouble sleeping for the last few nights. I'm exhausted um, and it's because we care. Uh, but more importantly, not only do we care, but we have the ability and the resources within our grasp to actually drive change. And so what keeps me up at night is the opportunity uh, that I think we all have in this conversation to start shaping and redefining even and reimagining our approach and the role that we all play in driving change in different ways. And so just thank you for um, not only having this program, but being bold in how you've defined it and started to shape the mission around the work that we want to continue together. As I think of this invitation, and I won't spend a lot of time on myself, but I think it's important um, to spend time thinking about and unpacking where it all began. Yes, I've spent 20 years, and I can't believe it's been 20 years, but 20 years in the philanthropic space. And before I knew I was a philanthropist, I was a philanthropist, and it goes back to my upbringing 
as a young woman in rural North Carolina, the eastern part of the state growing up in the 80s, uh, to two parents who were activists and became elected officials. Uh, but it really shaped me to understand that even in a town as small as Wilson, North Carolina, where we were plagued with racism and sexism and misogyny and extreme poverty, um, I grew up in a home with two parents who knew that they had the ability to drive change. And it felt in such a dire time, and it still is, but during such a dire time during my childhood and upbringing with two great parents who were you know, college educated and who done, had gone on to do great things, to know that they chose to go back home when they had other opportunities, right? But chose to go back home uh, to do their part to drive change in their own communities. And so that was the environment that I grew up in and I know so many of us have where we have a lineage and we have a history of people that were change makers without the cameras, without the fancy titles, you know, without all the infrastructure that so many of us have, but who did it because it was the right thing to do. And so as I think of the last 20 years of my career, and I was reflecting back um, as I prepared for this presentation on the work and where it all began, and it began in the nonprofit space working for a 501c3, uh, Jeff knows what I'm talking about, the Hip Hop Summit Action Network, and, and all of the work that we did then around economic empowerment and financial education and financial literacy. And we were just kids, you know, who didn't quite understand the true magnitude and power of what we were doing. But we did it because we knew it was the right thing to do. And as, as we all, and for the young people who are in this conversation too, as you start to lay the bricks on the foundation of your career, you don't always know where it will lead. We don't always have the full strategic plan and vision for our future, but I truly believe that we have a purpose here on earth. And once we start to discover that and unpack that from a place of giving, not what can we receive, but what can we give, I really think that we find our calling. And for me, that's what the Cleveland Foundation is about. I've read your mission. I'm very familiar with your vision and the track record and work that you all have led for decades. And so it's so important, you know, as we start to plant those seeds professionally, each of us individually, um, those seeds, we sometimes never know where they will blossom and grow. And I think of, you know, again, the last 20 years, there are so many moments. Um, I'll give one. When I was 25 years old, you know, entry level, young professional, you know, trying to find my way, working for a nonprofit at the time. and you know, I had this vision for myself um, of one day retiring and starting a nonprofit organization that's centered on women and inspiring women to find their own dreams and to find their own careers. And that was something I planned to retire and do at the age of maybe 70, 65 or 70. And at 25, though, you know, I had spent time um, with myself and said, you know, what am I waiting for? Why am I waiting? Um, until retirement and or until I get to a certain level or stage in my career to drive change. And it was that day at 25 years old that I started the process of creating the Women in Entertainment Empowerment Network. And we have now reached through that organization more than 87,000 young women um, over a 13 year period um, that are really focused and centered on their own professional development. And I think, you know, sometimes we wait for that big moment, Jeff. And I think sometimes we stall or we talk ourselves out of our purpose. But what I am so clear on, especially during this pandemic and during this crisis that we're in is that we don't have time to wait. We don't have time to procrastinate. Life is too short and the opportunity is in front of us right now to work boldly, to drive harder and to do the important and critical work that you all do and drive every single day and to do it together. And so I'd love to turn it back to Jeff to think about and have an honest and transparent conversation about, you know, what is the role that we play and how do we do that together? So, Jeff, I'll turn it over to you, but really inspired. And thank you again for this opportunity and conversation. Uh, Valisha, thank you so much. And, and you, you ended, I think, in, in such an apropos way, which is we can't wait. Um, I mean, even right now. I'm sure that you have been having a lot of the same conversations that I've been having in the last 24 to 72 hours with uh, nonprofit executives in multiple spaces around 
um, knee jerk reactions to this moment. And whether it's just dropping money in Minneapolis with organizations without having any conversation with people on the ground, or whether it's having conversations that frankly, certain nonprofit and philanthropic organizations haven't earned um, the credibility to have. Mm -hmm. um, how, do, how do we use this moment to level set in a way that says, wait a minute, there are organizations in the philanthropic space that have proclaimed a mission without relationship. And then there's philanthropic organizations that have done tremendous work to create relationships who now have the ability to serve as leadership in some cases to those who haven't. And that's not always easy. So I'm curious you know, how you're talking to people and, and how this moment can be a level set for the philanthropic community to look at the folks that have really provided leadership in serving the communities that have been impacted in the last 72 hours. So Jeff and everyone, let's unpack this for a moment, right? I think we're in a very critical state and I would argue maybe at a tipping point. And so I'll start from a place of optimism and positivity in that, you know, it's gotten our attention. And so for those who weren't paying attention before or maybe had fear and didn't really know how to enter the conversation or for maybe even those nonprofits who didn't feel like, to your point, they had the credibility, right, even, or the relationships established to enter this conversation now, I truly believe that we have a moment to level the playing field. There's a role right now that we can all play. And sadly, this tipping point has enabled us to do our part. Mm. And so for those who may feel some apprehension or fear or self-doubt around, you know, well, what is our readiness as an organization, right? What is my readiness as an individual and how do I play a role as an ally? How do I play a role as a, you know, a 501c3 or four, like whatever space you may be in, there is now an opportunity and a window where you can actually enter this conversation. So I think there, for me, there's a glimmer of like light and hope in that. However, the second part of that is being honest with ourselves and being honest with yourself on how have you shown up, right? And so when you do that, uh, when you do that self-reflection and establish your own baseline, and again, that can be an organizational baseline, like, hey, we've never spoken out or taken a stand ever on issues of racial injustice, for example. So my my response, if that is your baseline as an individual or as an organization to say, okay, now take a beat, right? You may not want to jump out today and make a bold statement, but maybe the first step is getting in a room with your leadership, with your team, and with people deeper in your organization to understand, well, what is the critical role that we can play and build a strategy around that? But do it now. Mm -hmm. Well, right. and, let's build, and, let's, and let's build on that a little bit, because I think as, as we start talking about giving, mm -hmm. I want to talk about, you, you and I have both been doing um, inclusion and equity work before anybody was calling it inclusion right. and equity work. <laughs> and, and it's not easy. And it, yeah. and it challenges us, even in organizations that I think are doing a decent job. Mm -hmm. um, I, I celebrate the Cleveland Foundation for, I think, some of the work that they've done in the city of Cleveland to lead some conversations around equity. Mm -hmm. um, but conversations are always kind of that first step. It's the institutional actual, actualization that becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. And so as you think about traditional philanthropy mm -hmm. and what it looks like, you know, who are the people that have been executives primarily in, in philanthropy um, at multiple levels? And as a result, how that informs um, who our grantees are, how that informs who our investors are. <laughs> Um, what is the role in this moment for inclusion and equity within the highest levels of especially our premier philanthropic organizations if we're going to have disruptive impact? Well, I think change starts at home, right? And so we have to look within first. And so my, my advice or my recommendation would be to look within your own organizations first, right? And this is for all of us. You know, we all have work to do. And I would say, look within first at your own representation within your organization and, and ask yourself the tough questions. Look at the data 
and see, you know, how are you representing, you know, underrepresented groups within your employee employees. So that's one, like look across your own um, house and look at the representation. But then the second is, you know, look at your leadership representation. You know, are you also seeing, you know, in the leadership ranks that representation because tone starts at the top. Um, and then the next layer of that to, to your point, Jeff, is, you know, if the answer is we have work to do, right, and for all of us, the answer is probably yes that you may want to take some initial steps to get your own house in order from a diversity and inclusion standpoint. And that can impact your donors, that can unlock access um, to additional donors and sponsors and, and other folks who may say, hey, you know, these organizations are doing the work, getting it right, I'm seeing the needle move within. And so now I'm willing to double down on my investment, right? Or make a, a first investment with this organization and contribution. So that's one, you know, getting our own houses in order. And I think it's important, right? And it goes back, Jeff, to your point, you know, we have to be careful uh, when we want to emerge as a thought leader, emerge, you know, as a very vocal external leader on issues that we may be grappling with internally. And so I would, I would just say, you know, think about the balance. And sometimes there are different ways that we can attack the same issue. You know, Jeff, to your point, you know, we have friends currently on the front lines in, many, in Minneapolis today, right? We're not there, right? So we know, you know that there are different ways to influence change. And so from a nonprofit and philanthropic space, you, know, you may decide you know, that you're ready to give a, a donation, right? You may decide that you have the infrastructure even to start building out your strategic plan in this area, right? And dedicate you know, resources there. And I think that there are ways um, from a philanthropic space that we can do it authentically. We could do it in a way that is still aligned with our mission for these organizations that we work for and that we've built, and that we've structured, but can still use the resources and the infrastructure that we've already built to drive change in a way that is still very aligned with our mission. And so, you know, part of that could be giving, a part of that could be partnership, a part of that could be amplifying the voices of those leaders who are on the front lines and there's so many ways that I think strategically we can do that without stepping out of who we are. That's, and, and that's a great segue, Valicia, because I, I think that having kind of that institution integrity um, and just honesty, right, mm -hmm. is, is always helpful in growth. Mm -hmm. and, and all of us are, all of our institutions are growing in different spaces. But then there's that ultimate piece, which is ROI, right? It's impact. And this becomes a tactical question. Um, I think I think that there have been many philanthropic institutions. I think the Cleveland Foundation is one that has been wrestling with this tension between programs and investment mm -hmm. um, towards the end of transformative impact. And 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 let's be honest, because I'm, I'm I don't know how to be anything else. One of the one of the gorillas riding the elephant in the room is so often philanthropy is about. How do we help wealthy people feel good about what they're not willing to transform? Mm -hmm. And so it becomes this piece where we fund programs that are in perpetual need of refunding without the true capacity for impact. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of where the, the whole industry is. Um, I've heard Wes Moore, who was, was one of our speakers previously, really talk about investment versus programs. And I'm really interested in your opinion on, on where you think we are in this moment, especially in lieu of not only the civil unrest that we're seeing and, and the rebellions that we're seeing, but also in, in the challenge we were already going to be faced with uh, the after effects of COVID and whatever this new world was going to be. So, so one, how should we be thinking about new ways to invest resources to ultimate impact? And then three, where are the places that disruption and innovation that sometimes we've learned from the private sector um, can now be employed in, in this current ecosystem? And I know that's a lot, but, but no, unpack that as you will. Yes, I think we have an opportunity um, right now during the economic crisis and downturn to reset and a part of that and some of the ways that I've seen organizations thrive, not only survive, but start to thrive during this time, um, is doing exactly what you've done here, right? And so when I think of innovation and technology being the key to unlock scale 
the key to unlock new partnership, um, especially with, you know, the private sector, if that's, you know, the space where you're seeking, you know, increased um, opportunity and partnership, there's a big scale factor there. There's a big innovation piece there. Um, and the goal, though, is to always stick to your core values. And when we think of, you know, our partners and our donors, of course, you know, to your point, Jeff, you know, we understand like that's how, you know, we keep the mission alive. You know, that's how we keep our programs thriving. That's how we're able to have, you know, and sustain, you know, these great organizations. Um, however, it is important that we're super clear and crisp on our values. Mm -hmm. And those values can evolve over time. And so one of the things, um, especially for some of the organizations that I've been a part of, that have been around for many, many years, you know, I always encourage um, us to every few years, you know, revisit the mission, revisit the vision and your core values and your value statement to make sure, you know, it still reflects where you are as an organization, but also where the world is. Mm -hmm where the world is. And so I think, you know, it would be a huge blind spot, you know, if we didn't at this time take a moment, and this is for all of us, to look back at our mission and vision, to look back at our programs, to make sure that they are still relevant, to make sure that they are still um, forward thinking in, in how we're approaching the work and looking around the corner over the next five to 10 years and where we think things are going. You know, coming most recently from Google, I can honestly say, um, you know, a company that, you know, hasn't, you know, made all the right decisions, but has been really bold in where they've invested their resources, um, especially, especially from a philanthropic standpoint. And, and racial justice has been a large part of that profile. And so just something to think about, you know, we're starting to see corporations make very similar, you know, transitions and evolving even how they are, you know, deciding, you know, where they're making those investments and racial justice. Um, and of course, you know, um, and racial also, equity. Yes, racial equity. That's right. And social impact has been a big part of the decision making process. So I want to build on that a little bit, because I think that that really speaks to the need for us to be strategic. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we um, traditional philanthropy has talked about areas of giving versus areas of impact. Mm -hmm. And I know that that can be a nuance to some people or it can be semantics to others. But I think when I when I think about even what what um, Robert Johnson did at Morehouse, um, there are many that would say, well, why wouldn't you think about doing that broadly and sprinkle mm -hmm. that around? Um, but when you think about, uh, I, I talked to Good Game a couple of weeks ago about, you know, are you all doing an economic impact study on what this gift actually meant at Morehouse? Mm -hmm. And the fact that you are literally changing the trajectory yeah. of generational wealth for an entire graduating class of an institution. And they said that they are doing that economic impact study and starting to follow those young men. But I'm curious, as, as you think about potential strategic areas of impact in this moment, even though we're not clear on what the next six months are gonna be, is there, is there anything that you're seeing um, that says, yeah, these are areas that I think we should be thinking about strategically impacting, um, or even a methodology of how to think about that strategic impact we wanna make? Yeah, I think, you know, it goes back to everything you just said, you know, we're doing this work not only because it's the right thing to do, but there's real business value in it. You know, there's a value proposition. And, you know, when I think of the numbers and you all here are, are certainly familiar with this, but, you know, African-American women entre entrepreneurs are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. You know, African-American women are the highest educated group. We lead at the voting poll, you know, booth each election cycle. I mean, the numbers continue a trillion dollars or more in annual spending power. And so when you think of that, right. I would say to invest in and bet on and partner with black women and black men entrepreneurs. And so the economic impact that we could have collectively by making that type of investment partnership and really looking at those areas and those businesses, even in the Cleveland area and across the state of Ohio, even where you're saying, you know, what is the black economic agenda and how can we partner, support and invest in that? 
And I think you'll start to see, back to Jeff's point, uh, with the Morehouse example, if you do it in not only from a study standpoint, but in a cohort, if you think of, you know, what is this body, you know, of work? What, who are these entrepreneurs that we want to not only partner with, but understand, learn from, you know, share best practices with and start to set a, a vision over time? Maybe it's a five or 10 year period where you say, OK, this is the area where we want to invest. Right. This is the area where we want to partner, not help. I want to make that clear. It's not helping. It's partnership and investment where you truly see the value in the entrepreneurs in the area who are doing the work every day, who are thriving and who are <laughs> seeking partnership to scale that vision and mission. And I think, you know, there's opportunity sometimes right at home. And often we're always looking for the big thing, the big opportunity, you know, what are other states doing? And instead, you know, we'll find usually, and I know for sure in Ohio, there are entrepreneurs right there, you know, who are right and ready for the next level of investment and partnership. And so I would start there and, and just say, you know, while I don't have all the answers, I think there is opportunity today in the economic empowerment development and scale of those businesses that will then influence the entire community. Can you stay there for a second, Valicia? Because I think it's a, it's a great example of how we can talk about disruption. Mm -hmm. um, because in, in certain places, there has been a traditional model mm -hmm. around what does it mean to support early stage entrepreneurs. Uh, and you and I both know that there are, there are hundreds of people that we have raised money from who have have refused to give to traditional philanthropy, not because they don't see the value in those institutions, but because they question the disruptive nature of the strategy. Mm. And so what are some things that we can be doing, not only to walk out those things that you just mentioned, but if we want to build a new ecosystem of donors, um, that have a different sensibility about how to get impact. What are the ways that we can start creating those new ecosystems of donors? And how have you seen an effective way of cultivating them and even creating leaders within um, those groups to help us engage new investors and funders that traditionally have just been uninterested in traditional philanthropy? Well, I think, I think it starts with two things, right? One, the data and really understanding, you know, where are those businesses, where are those entrepreneurs and, you know, where are they in, at what stage are they in, right, in their business? And then the second step, and, and I would fast follow that, like pull the data that you can and that you have access to, but then the fast follow is real conversation, mm. right? And it sounds so fundamental, but I think so many of us, you know, operate in our bubbles. I'm guilty of it too, where, you know, we, we look to the data, we set our strategic plan, and then we begin the outreach. And I really think that there's value right now in constructive dialogue, honest dialogue on what could the partnership model look like, right? With our nonprofits and our entrepreneurs in that market. And once you have honest dialogue and not everyone is going to agree, you know, people may come in with, you know, a different point of view, but you can then take that data because that's probably going to be the richest data you can have and then analyze it and say, okay, these are the three things that we as an organization want to accomplish. And now that we have that input, now we're going to create a plan and model on how we want to engage. And I think, you know, when it starts with the data and the conversation, it can then shape and inform and help us actually move faster in our approach to drive the change. And so, you know, I would start with those like very basic fundamental steps, um, but then we've got to move, right? And so I think a part of moving means, and this is again fundamental, but I believe in like unpacking how to operationalize. Yeah. And it's having one or two dedicated people over a period of time, maybe it's six months, that can really go deep and focus on this very specific area to build out the plan. And I think so often we have folks who have core roles and who have, you know, five different responsibilities, and then that thing gets moved from top of the list to number five. But if you would just mm -hmm. take the time, because so many of us here, all of us are leaders, to just 
because you have the ability to, to dedicate one or two resources now to figuring that out over a six to 12 month period, I think we'll start to see at least a path forward and on a way to accelerate um, the growth in that area. Well, I, I think this is a good point in the conversation to open it up. Um, and we really want to hear from those of you who are participants. So what we're going to do is we're going to place you into groups. Um, this wonderful technology will do that. You don't have to push anything at this point. Uh, and some of our APC representatives, uh, members of our committee, are going to help guide you through some discussions to set up questions to ask Belisha. And so um, please be aggressive with your questions. She can handle it. Um, be provocative with your questions. That's what she wants. And, um, and just know that at the end of the day, this is a safe community um, for us to have, I think to Valicia's point, the conversation that a lot of people are not having. Uh, so you'll be broken up into groups. It'll take it about 10 minutes. Um, you'll be led by one of our committee members, <clears throat> excuse me. And then with about one minute left, you'll see a, a, a warning uh, come up. You'll come back into our full program and we will ask Felicia some of those questions. So excited about what you all are getting ready to do. Welcome back everybody. Thank you for participating in that group discussion. Um, we're super excited to hear what you have to say. And if we could start with uh, Belva. Belva, what's your, uh, what's your group's question? How do we develop a deep pipeline to ensure that we have leaders at the table who are able to speak to these issues. So we realize that we have people in various places. I'm now talking about African Americans, but are we sitting, are we part of the infrastructure that is making the difference for, you know, sustainability and transformation? Hmm. Alicia? Great question, Belva, and to the entire group that met on it. And, and I think it starts with, um, recognizing to your point belva that the leaders are there and sometimes leadership is found in the most unexpected places mm -hmm. and so i would start with you know the identification part and that means getting deep in your community and asking every leader that you know for two leaders that you may not know and i would guarantee you that there is a pipeline that already exists of those emerging leaders in your community who are already doing the work and who are making their way. And, and so I think it's a part of um, asking for those leaders who are already within your network to go deeper and to shine light on those emerging leaders who are already proven or doing the work. So that's the first step. The second step is around leadership development. And so while many of us may be leaders, Many of those emerging leaders may be emerging leaders. There's still room for development, and I think we all need it, right? I think, you know, just as we innovate in business, just what, as we transform and evolve, Jeff and I were just having a conversation about that as professionals, we too as leaders have to evolve over time, especially with the current state that we're in. So I would say development being a part of that and mentorship. Um, but then the third part of it is really making sure that those leaders are in position, right? So there's one thing to have a pipeline. There's another thing to have a strategy on how to truly activate the plan. And so I would really think strategically about um, not only the plan, but the role that those leaders can play now in that plan and really making sure that we're um, kind of changing the guard of leadership. You know, it's so funny. I talked to my dad and I have, big debates all the time um, around like even, you know, across elected officials and, you know, organizations like what is the succession plan? <laughs> right. I think so many of us just want to hold on to the end when we need fresh talent. We need young ideas. We need need fresh legs and fresh eyes and those young people who may be able to see things a little differently than we do. Right. Mm -hmm. While still not replacing the institutional knowledge that we have right and so you never want to just replace one for the other but i think there's a, a dance that we have in marriage even in partnership with our young leaders that we have to find and if we don't we become obsolete mm -hmm. 
And and just I, I have to, Valicia, because I, I want I want to know if you agree with this before we go to Justin's group. I think in the African American community in particular, there is probably twenty percent of uh, those old people who are trying to stay there forever. But there's eighty percent. No, 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 no. But hear me. But there's eighty percent of elders that don't have anywhere else to go. Yes. And so yeah. when 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 white folks yes. and wealthy folks have run their service somebody sets up something for them. So there's a, a, there's a foundation that's set up that they run and they become chairman emeritus of that. And then they show up with a level of honor. They don't have to hustle for cash. They're not wondering where their health insurance is coming from. I mean, there should have been a Institute for Women in Politics that Dorothy Height could run as opposed to having to be in meetings until 80 something years old for the organization that she helped to build. There, there should have been a Jesse Jackson leadership for electoral politics. There should have been a, you know what I mean? That There's an opportunity yeah. in our community to have legacy philanthropic institutional infrastructure that gives those elders a place to go of honor and actually gives them the peace to say, wait a minute, I can now leave this organization and not have to stay here because I don't know where else they're going to help me live. And, and that I, I think we, we underestimate that reality within that succession planning piece. And it's also a place of potential funding for new institutional infrastructure. Yes. And what I'll add is that what I what I observed, I should say, is that, you know, so many of us, you know, do the work. Right. And then we look up one day and time has flown by. And when we're doing the work that we're doing, right, the hard work, the philanthropic work, the work in the trenches, right, you know, even from a nonprofit, a successful, mature nonprofit space, right, it's still really hard taxing work. And I think, you know, what we have to do to Jeff's point is not only respect our elders and the foundation and the investment of time and energy and heart that they put into this work. But we also have a responsibility as young people, and I don't even know if I, I can fit in that category anywhere either. <laughs> but we have a responsibility, right? As they, as we inspire them to succession plan and bridge the gap with us, we have a responsibility to make sure that as we continue to move up and get empowered and lifted into those spots, that we honor them too. There's still a role, right? And I think that we forget sometimes with our you know belief that we have a lot of answers to a lot of things we always or we often forget that we too still need the institutional knowledge we need to know how to navigate these spaces we need to understand maybe the the challenges and the wars even that they fought that we have no idea are in front of us and so their tools and the toolkit that we need to. And so I think there's this partnership and this intergenerational um, alignment that we need because right now, right, I hear from young people every day, right? You know, I'm not feeling included in the process. Mm -hmm. I don't receive mentorship, you know, from people that I reach out to. So guess what? I'm going to just run for office. And these young folks are winning. And oh, then they yeah. get into these seats with the best of intentions and don't really know how to do the work. For being honest, right? And so I think there's a role that we play in being good to each other in the process of pipeline building and succession planning. Awesome. Um, thank you for that. Justin, your group, uh, what question did you all come up with? So our, our question, I think it ties directly into some of the comments that were just made, really came from a point of healthy frustration. Uh, and it was around how do we navigate past the corporate and institutional glass ceiling that prevents us from impacting change. And to dig into that a little bit more, you know, how do we, how do we actually link the people with the need with the, the funders and allow the people with the need to continue to drive the narrative of what needs to occur? Great question. Alicia. Great question. Um, so how do I unpack this? So I think, it's interesting, right, that what I'm learning, my good friend Jeff and I, again, we're just having a conversation about this. What I'm learning is that there are different ways to influence change, 
right? And what I've chosen in recent years is to do it from the inside out of corporations, right? And so there was a time when, you know, I was the one marching on the front lines, right? I remember, you know, many marches where, you know, I'm, I'm on the streets with the sign pounding the pavement. And still, right, I believe that I'm driving as much change, if not more change, from the inside out of being able to have, you know, participation in the funding decisions that are made, leadership, you know, and a seat at the table as, you know, we're deciding, you know, what are those organizations where, you know, we want to make an investment? Where, what are those organizations doing the work, right, where we want to help scale their impact? And so I think that, you know, there's a part of this conversation, um, Justin, to your point around, you know, how do we influence? What is the role that we play? And within those spaces, how do we break the glass ceiling? And I think the answer to that, for me at least, has been to use my story, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've found is that whenever I go into corporate spaces, whenever I go into the tech sector, and I'm in those rooms when I'm the only one, and it happens almost every day at this point, I'm usually the only, I'm always the only black person. I'm usually the only woman, right? And certainly the only black woman. And it is in those moments, right, that I go into my pitch, I go into my presentation or a part of the decision-making table. And not only do I leverage the data, because that is important, not only do I leverage, you know, the track record and, and whatever it is that, you know, that I'm positioning in the moment or advocating for, but then I tell my story. And I think sometimes we forget that there's actual power and value in telling our story from a very truthful place that can change the hearts and minds and decision makers in that moment. And so, you know, I'll say that I found, you know, the greatest impact and I've been able to shatter through some of those ceilings when I lead with brutal unapologetic authenticity in those moments on top of all the other things we just talked about. So that's part of it. But then I think once we get in the room, right, I think I'm in the room now, right? I, I hit the C-suite. I'm at the table. Now I bet you for damn sure I won't be the only one. That's how we break glass ceilings, mm -hmm. right? And so for me, it was less about me getting into the room, more about, okay, if I'm in that room, now it becomes, it goes from me to we. That's the goal, right? And so for me, it's like, how do you crack it just enough that you unlock the opportunity and access for all the people watching, for mm -hmm. all the generations coming behind you that makes it normal now for us to apply for those roles, that makes it normal now for us to have a seat at the table, that normalizes us taking up space where we should have been anyway. Right. And so for me, that's how we break the glass ceiling. And then to your last part, Justin, in, in that group, I'll say from a philanthropic space, too. So, you know, I was talking before about navigating those spaces from within, but there's also a way to navigate them from without. And if we get really savvy and super intentional about how we're packaging the nonprofit work that we do, how we're showing and demonstrating the value and back to Jeff's point earlier, the impact of what we do and we could show the value proposition, right? Like these corporations and these donors, right? Understand, right? And we know this, the bottom line. And there's a way through the work that we do to drive change to show also how it's leading to outcomes, right? It can lead to consumers. It can lead to unique visitors um, on a site. It can lead to conversion metrics where that person who went to the site has now clicked to donate or has decided to volunteer for that thing or has decided, you know, to do, you know, a number of things because of that initial engagement. And so if you start to package the work, show and demonstrate the impact and then tell the story. I've gone and been a part of so many pitch meetings now from nonprofits to Fortune 5, not Fortune 500, but to Fortune 5 companies. Oh. And it boils down to the story, the mission, right? Because everyone has the data. Everyone has the metrics. You know, when you get to that stage, like that becomes the baseline. But the thing that carries you across the line becomes the people. How do you mm -hmm. humanize the data? What are the lives that you've changed? And what is the opportunity for impact and scale if they invest? 
That's good. Um, Bashira, can you share uh, the question from your group, please? Um, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, one of the key words I think we can take away from this summit is impact. Uh, that's a word used a lot. And so one of the questions we had um, was that many philanthropic organizations are giving to a lot of worthy issues. Um, and these are all very well-intentioned efforts, but we know that they're not having the impact we're hoping for because the problems still exist. So how do these philanthropic organizations better align to maximize their impact on the issues that are most important for us, particularly as it relates to um, economic mobility for people of color? Hmm. Great, great question. And I'm gonna flip it just a bit and I hope it still tackles the question, but if not, tell, let me know. So one of the things coming from the tech space, especially that I've learned, right, is that when we're talking in terms of scale and numbers, right? Like we're talking, you know, in some cases, billions and trillions of dollars in revenue and like, you know, big funds where they decide, you know, where the, that, that money's gonna go. Um, and then you get down to the numbers, right? So if we're talking specifically about, um, if I'm being honest, like African-American businesses, you know, if we're talking about you know, the impact of some of our nonprofit organizations, it feels small in an industry of so much scale. Mm. Work with me. I'm, I'm about to unpack this, right? So when we're talking about organizations like a YouTube, right, where the goal is the next billion users, right? They're already at a billion, the next billion users. You know, when we're talking of companies in tech that receive hundreds of millions of users a day, right? It's hard. Like I literally feel a lump in my throat every time I'm there when I hear um, those moments where, like even with my nonprofit, 86,000 women reached over a 13 year mm -hmm. period. On the surface, that's nothing. When we're in the world of scale and volume, right? And big change meaningful change, right? Like, so one of the things that I've started to shift the narrative around from an impact perspective is, do we want to talk quality or quantity? So yes. that's one. Big, right? So scale is cool. Scale is important. It's valuable. But when we're talking about quality, in my case and in our case, we're not talking about, you know, changing the world today, we're talking about a micro-targeted approach that can get super granular and focused around the quality of programs that we're delivering and the quality of impact to the people that we touch and the businesses that we touch. That's good. So for me, it's, there's a quality quantity case that is made in this big conversation around scale where the impact that we made may, make may feel really small. So there's that layer of it. The second layer, when you start getting into those conversations and then when we walk out the room, because I've been on the other side, we walk out the room and the conversation is about statistical significance, <laughs> statistical relevance, right? Which is going back to the same thing. We small fish in a big pond in this world unless we flip the narrative. And so the quality quantity piece around impact is one, but the second for me is around it is statistically relevant. And here's why. Because you have an opportunity to capture data and understand a critical part segment of this market that you want to scale and impact. Right? So if you look, if you, what I've seen work is if you flip it in these conversations to while, you know, this may not reflect the scale that you may on, on first glance envision, for the decisions that you're going to make at the donor table or these investments, I encourage you and I even challenge you to think differently in this moment about it. This is a key input in your strategy. This is a key element in your equation to decide, right? Is this a market that you want to tap into and unlock? Is this an area where you want to double down? And if so, right, consider this to be a key part of your vision and strategy for scale in the African-American market, right? And so there's a way to enter the conversation that leverages and positions 
the impact that may feel small in a really big and meaningful way in those moments that can still make you stand out and have a competitive advantage from maybe some of those other big national organizations that have a chapter in Cleveland, for example. Right. And so micro targeted quality impact metrics um, and then, of course, results that you can prove and show and demonstrate already like that's that's understood. I know that work is already happening. No, I, I love that. And, and it speaks to your point earlier about entrepreneurship, supporting entrepreneurship as an example. We ju I just got done for a client doing um, some insights work with about 50 black male entrepreneurs because this client wants to do a fund to support early stage entrepreneurs. Forty nine of those 50 entrepreneurs said, I would rather see you take all that money and fund one guy that can scale in a way that the others can't than 50 guys with small gifts that don't create the impact. I mean, and uh, literally 49 of them said, because if you do that right, then that's three times the number of jobs created. That's 10 times the amount of revenue created. That revenue is able to be a hundredfold invested back into that community in a way that you can't do with the with businesses that can't scale and and we'd be hard pressed honestly to find folks that are courageous enough to say let's take all that money and fund one versus what it looks like what the narrative is to say we funded 50. and so even the disruption i, I love that you said narrative and comms because you and I have both done enough of that to know that how courageous can you be about allowing the data to lead you to what the larger impact is versus what feels better. Um, so I, I don't, I don't want to dig too much further into that because we do have two more questions. Um, and if we can go to uh, Antoine, uh, what did your group come up with? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So Valicia and Jeff, you guys both just kind of touched on the operative word of scale, which is a great segue for the question my group came up with. And it's simply, how can philanthropic giving and resources be used to help businesses be sustainable and make profits? Sustainable and make profits. Give it to me one more time, Antoine. Yeah, absolutely. How can philanthropic giving and resources be used to help businesses be sustainable mm -hmm. and make profits and profitable? Well, I think there, there are a couple of ways um, to approach it. So I think philanthropic giving, of course, you know, can be a part of, you know, the infrastructure for businesses, right? And so that's a part of it. You know, many businesses um, that we know of and that we work with and who are you know, doing well and thriving don't always have the infrastructure in place for the scale that they seek and desire. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think infrastructure building um, is a part of that and investing in the infrastructure so that when they do scale or that when they, you know, reach the point where it's time to maybe expand, have a solid infrastructure in place to make that possible and sustainable. So infrastructure is one. The second is around innovation. Um, so many of our businesses, um, you know, I think um, are thinking globally and acting locally, which is important, yes. right? But we cannot forget to think global as you know we start to reach traction locally. So follow me. So I think innovation is a part of that, right? Technology is a part of that. How do we invest in those entrepreneurs and in those businesses who are doing great things locally, who have a proven track record, who are you know successful in the market? And how do we invest in their innovation um, and technology so that they can uh, tap into the global economy? And, and I think that goes beyond the brick and mortar. You know, really looking at um, digital and technology as a way to scale those businesses, um, especially we're seeing in COVID in a time when technology and innovation is key to growth and success. And so I would say those would be the two areas that, that came to mind um, up, up top. But then I would just say the third is to ask. You know, I think sometimes there are needs within businesses um, that we don't always understand or or we think we know. But, you know, it may be that one thing um, that a business needs, especially during this time, to just get through the crisis, um, to get over the hump and to ultimately on the other side of this, you know, have the growth 
um, um, that they want. And so, I, you know, those will be the first infrastructure and technology and innovation to tap into the global economy. But then the third is to ask the question. And I would start with a few, you know, who have, again, a proven track record um, who, you know, may have needs, like I would do a needs assessment and ask, you know, what are the, the greatest opportunities for impact that we could contribute to? That's awesome. Our last group is Steven's group. Um, Steve, what, 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 what are we hearing from your group? Yeah, my group is, uh, is frustrated. <laughs> and so there's a, the question of, will we ever have a unified front in the African-American culture? And if so, how? And the B clause to that is, uh, how do you take that anger and rage and frustration that we're seeing across our country and put strategy behind it uh, so that we can have a plan for everyone to follow? Jeff, I'd love to hear your answer. I have, I have thought, I know we're not talking about this. But I would love to hear what Jeff has to say because he's the genius here. Yeah, I, I struggle with that problem because I think when, even, even when elected officials um, or corporations that I'm advising talk to me about Black people, I, I say, which ones are you talking about? And so I have a, I have a challenge with this notion that there's ever been a universal uh, black agenda that everybody responded to versus multiple agendas that are about impact that various segments of the community can get behind. Um, and that's a challenging conversation for a lot of us because many of us still want uh, the, the full uh, black community kumbaya moment uh, where we're all holding hands, sitting around a campfire um, celebrating the, the same 10 points. Um, but I just know black people who fundamentally disagree with other black people about not only what they want, but how they get there. And so I think the question for me, um, as we talk about agendas and whether it's the agendas of, um, really passionate and committed young people on the ground right now in multiple cities that are angry, um, or whether it's the agendas of legacy organizations that are attempting to make impact connected to their mission. Um, I think that bespoke, um, small digestible um, agendas that are uber focused on creating impact in a specific area are critical to offering menus of opportunities uh, to the complexity of our community of where people can plug in so we're not at, we're not saying you have to agree fundamentally on 52 issues in order to say that you want to be a part of something. And I think so often we deny people the ability to plug in because we're asking them to agree with the entire community on an entire slate of issues, as opposed to saying, listen, I, 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 Valicia and I have both been involved in places that were incredibly successful because it was single issue mobilization. And everybody that was at that table was at that table for that singular issue with that singular impact. And whether we agreed or disagreed on 15 other issues, it happened at 15 other tables, not at that table. And so I think strategically there is a real model for how single issue mobilization and really bespoke targeted development of agendas helps create ecosystems of productivity versus spaces where people are debating about what the agenda should be, as opposed to mobilizing around impact, even if we, and, and I think finally, it, it's really about how do we see ourselves as pieces on a chessboard versus players uh, playing checkers. I agree. Um with what Jeff said, especially around the single issue mobilization, Steve. And I think, you know, I too am angry and hurt right now. Um, but, you know, I, I think back over the years to many rooms that I've been in where, you know, nationally, you know, leaders have gotten into the basement, you know, gone to the kitchen table. So countless times, the most recent one was at Sylvia's restaurant in Harlem. And we all came into the room and we spent hours, you know, working on a collective black agenda. Everyone was there from artists to musicians, to activists, to educators, physicians, lawyers, you know, the whole thing. And we walked away <laughs> with the goal of having three issues that turned into 50, you know, because back to Jeff's point, you know, everyone has a different goal 
in a, in a place that, you know, they want to enter the movement for change. And I think, um, and that's okay. And I'm learning that that is okay, right? We're not a monolith. We are complex. Um, and I think it's important that we respect, you know, um, everyone for what they bring and, and the goals that they want to achieve. However, right, I'm with you. And I think that when we are able to align on one issue and have single issue mobilization and get laser focused on that goal that we want to accomplish together, you know, that's when we're going to see more impact and see more progress. And so, you know, I'm at a place, quick, funny story. Um, a couple years ago, I was at um, it, another round, similar round table. It was uh, in New Orleans during Essence Festival, similar conversation. And I was exactly where you were. This is just a couple years ago. I was exactly where you were. I was like, can we just get in the room and walk away with a collective agenda? <laughs> so naive, I'm not calling you naive, but I was so naive in that moment. And I was taken to task by a sister that I respect to this day, but she said to me, and I don't know if I fully agree with this, but she said to me in the moment, and it hit me like a ton of bricks, would you ask Coke and Pepsi to do the same thing? <laughs> would you ask them that? She said, so why would you ask us as activists and nonprofit organizers and founders to do the same thing? And she said, I'm not implying that we're competitors, but what I am implying and saying to you is that we have different agendas and missions and goals. So we shouldn't be forced in this conversation to walk away with one agenda when we are very clear on what our agenda is. Mm. And so, you know, for what that's worth, you know, I was in my feelings that day about it. I was so hurt um, and I was representing a major corporation at the time. So I just felt silly, but, but it was real <laughs> homework for me to do. Right. And so the single issue mobilization is big for me. I do think that we need to get in the room more and have conversations about what it is, what is it that we want to accomplish. And then I think we need to support those organizations, right, like the Cleveland Foundation, who are clear and who have set agendas and figure out what is the role that we can play to support and get it across the line. Mm -hmm. But I think that also goes back to, to your conversation earlier, um, even about entrepreneurship, because because ultimately some of these small organizations are just social impact entrepreneurs. And perhaps we should be looking at them as scalable individual institutions. So if we see leaders that we believe in, because because anybody that doesn't understand VC is that VC is less about funding a company and it's more about funding a CEO or a founder. And so often we see these really great leaders on the ground, but we don't fund them. Um, we, we don't we don't say, listen, what would it take to scale you? Uh, to be able to do this work on a level that could create real impact citywide or regionwide or statewide? Um, who do we need to put around you where there's gaps in your institutional organizational leadership? Um, and here are corporations, because sometimes it's not about funding their, their, um, their payroll as much as it is, here are three or four executives on loan that we're gonna give you for six months to a year to help you have a level of excellence in doing your books, in doing planning and engaging with the media, so on and so forth. So I think that, uh, Antoine, to, to, to your point, sometimes it's we actually fund a broader agenda when we say who are people that have already exhibited a level of excellence but need support scaling. And if I scale these three organizations and I'm actually scaling impact in these um, agenda areas. Sometimes we want to build the agenda, but not build the infrastructure to impact the agenda. And there's organizations to Valicia's point and leaders there um, that, that often, <laughs> and this could be dangerous, that often don't get the shine because we're trying to figure out what national organization to give money to that actually doesn't even have the impact, um, the capacity rather to create impact at the local scalable level. Um, I want to see if there's another, we've got time for one more question. So there's a, is there another? Yeah, yeah, Felicia, please. And just one more thing. This is so singular, but it's probably the most important thing. If we don't know where to start, let's start with November. Mm. Well, right. That could be the single issue, nonpartisan, right? But just vote. And if that became the singular, singular issue from today, <laughs> through November around voter education, voter registration and turnout, right? I think that can spark the change, right? And demonstrate the impact when we work together. 
And so. But I don't, I don't know if single issue mobilization means single issue focus. Mm -hmm. So yeah. single issue mobilization yeah. is about what's the pawn on the board, what's the knight on the board, what's the rook on the board, what's the bishop on the board. And the bishop is singularly focusing on 2020 mobilization. The knight on the board is singularly focusing on violence reduction through opportunity. The bishop on the board is singularly focusing on um, how to ensure access to capital and resources for early stage entrepreneurs. And so single issue mobilization doesn't mean that our community is only doing one thing. It means that we're rallying behind folks that have committed to doing one thing excellent than 50 things in a mediocre way. Um, so so I, I, th there's a lot there for us. And I think there's so many of us that want to do things differently. Do them. Um, but just do them with a level of excellence. Uh, I want, want to see if we can get one more question uh, before we before we begin to move to, to closing our day. Uh, Jeff, this is Bashara. Um, one of the questions we had in our group um, was about organizations' capacity, uh, specifically, what kind of work on the individual level can we do to build power, and then also, what kind of work should organizations of all kinds do? to build wealth in communities of color beyond service delivery. And just to frame that, we often are doing to and not with. So nonprofits deliver services to people of color. Corporations might uh, sponsor an event. Philanthropy gives money. But what can they do beyond just the service delivery aspect <laughs> to help build wealth? <laughs> There's the question. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll start, Jeff. I would love to know what you think too. So on the first one, on the individual level, I think every organization should have a sponsorship program internally for their group. Mm -hmm. And by sponsorship, I'm, I'm sure you are, I'm preaching to the choir, but there's a difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Right? Mentorship, we know what that is, but so sponsorship means having real advocates assigned to individuals and young professionals and underrepresented minorities and everyone in that organization who's not in the seat at the senior leadership level to really develop advocate for and pull right them up into leadership positions and so that's super super granular but programs and uh, sponsorship programs have proven to work and so that's one um, from an individual level um, that's super technical, but it's proven to work and I think can be done now in every organization mm -hmm. that we're in. Um, and then the second one, Bashar, there's so many ways we could go there, but I think one area where I've seen um, a lot of need is in, in addition to financial investment or support of an organization or program or an event, to your point, having production support like mm. event production and logistical support and, and it's it sounds so simple but it becomes a huge relief not only from a budget line item perspective but just like reducing the burden or sharing the weight of what it requires to pull off big events big programs like this right and that we're doing in our communities and and you know there have been so many times not to go into a lot of detail but that I've shown up to events that I've been a part of as a speaker or a guest or as a sponsor even for a nonprofit organization. And they've done all the planning work. This happened just recently, all the planning work. In this case, I, I, I was there as a sponsor. So we gave a big financial contribution, like a couple hundred thousand dollars to the event. And now we show up as the sponsors. And I'll never forget, this is recent, a few members of my team who are more junior were just complaining, right? I can't believe, you know, our corporate thing isn't there. I can't believe, you know, our table wasn't set up there. And just like through a tantrum, right? Keep in mind, we're the corporation in this moment. Through a tantrum about how the nonprofit didn't live up to the expectations or the, the deliverables that set, had been set. And in that moment, I had to take my staff over to the side and have a conversation with them. And I said, hey, hold on, right? You've got to understand the importance of having an infrastructure and having the human resource and capacity to pull off events of this magnitude and we know from a nonprofit space there's but so much we can give to events from a budget standpoint 
so much to staff, right? And general administration mm-hmm. expenses to, to, you know, so we know the behind the scenes, but I had to educate my team who had a lot of influence in terms of how decisions were made from a budget standpoint. They were ready to just throw the organization away, right? And I had to remind them and I had to remind us that they're in addition to financial support, infrastructure support, human capital support and production support in moments like this may have equal if not more value, right? Mm. To pull off a seamless event because we know from a nonprofit perspective how tired we are by the day of the event how exhausted we are by the day of the event. So imagine, right, from a donor standpoint or a corporate standpoint, we just gave some lift to the staff and to the team to make it a seamless, well-executed event because they are already, we are already, I put myself in that too, at the stage of burnout by showtime, by days like this, right, we're burnt out. And so, you know, I think, you know, that's one area um, that, that feels small, but I know from experience, can be huge in the value that we give and contribute. And then the last thing I'll say is back to how I felt so compelled in that moment to educate my staff. You know, when you have moments like that to redirect conversation and shift the narrative around, you know, the professionalism of our nonprofit organizations, the value of our nonprofit organizations, the understanding of, you know, how to deliver, you know, and, and all those things, you know, whenever you have those moments, even with a sponsor or a donor or an organization where it may be a bit misunderstood or they might not fully understand the context of why things might be so, right? I think we as leaders here can redirect and shift and reshape that narrative in a way that still empowers and shows the value of continued partnership and investment. Yeah, I, 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 there's not much that I could add to that, um, Felicia. I, I, I do think, however, that um, there's this notion that I, th- I think there was even a question that came in from one of the viewers around this diff- this um, this demonization of capitalism, um, in that philanthropy should be careful about how it engages in capitalism, and and I think that that's true. However. I do believe that as we think about impact that truly creates wealth creation, that philanthropy on its own doesn't create wealth. And so unless there is a real strategy that is connected to, um, that's connected to um, impact work that has double bottom line value, or market-driven solutions to social problems, um, it's difficult to say that you're going to create wealth when you don't create money. And it's difficult to say that you're going to create wealth for people when you're not creating wealth. And the only way you do that is through market-driven solutions. And so I think that there's, and and, and and that's not groundbreaking. I mean, I think that there are a number of people in the impact space that are very clear about figuring out What are market-driven solutions to systemic social problems that ensure that even if a profit is made, that the investment of that profit goes back into the impact? And then secondly, understanding the sustainability of market-driven impact um, that, you know, traditional philanthropic programs will never be able to do. And and, and I think organizations like the Cleveland Foundation have been thinking about that and strategizing, strategizing through that not just recently, for a considerable amount of time. Um, so I, I, I even applaud, I think, the, the, the leadership of the Cleveland Foundation in ensuring that some of the program managers have training in investment because they recognize where this shift is happening. And while it may not be uh, uh, throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater, it's definitely thinking about really innovative ways to test how um, investment impact, in, impact investing uh, can create sustainable change and transformation in ways that traditional program funding may not be able to, especially in certain areas, wealth creation being one of them. So that's the only thing that I would add there. Um, I will say this, um, we have been unbelievably blessed uh, to have this much time with Valicia, uh, not just because of, of who she is, um, the, the work that she's done, and the organizations that she's been with, uh, because there were just so many easy ways for her to say, I'm tired. 
Um, COVID has me stressed out. And this shift in work uh, has a ton of deliverables. But in the last 72 hours, um, we would be insane if we didn't acknowledge that all of us are dealing with a level of fatigue. And all of us in different ways are dealing with a level of heaviness. And if we did not um, acknowledge the mental health reality um, struggle that a lot of us are going through. So I'm thankful not that Felicia, Felicia accepted the invitation and not that she agreed to pivot to a virtual um, summit. I am thankful that this morning she said, I can do this. Um, because it would have been justifiable to say, Jeff, uh, Cleveland Foundation, this moment is too much. And I got to lean into my husband and my children and my tribe because uh, we're all not healthy right now. So, Valisha, I thank you not only for waging through what all of us are dealing with this moment, just with a level of energy and passion uh, and insightfulness. Uh, I thank you for continuing to say yes and show up whole, show up with your full self, um, even when it's hard to. Uh, so thank you so, so much for all that you gave us today. I want to um, also shift, in, in, and if you want to stay connected to her, I know we're going to put up a slide that, that shows all of her social media information as well as information on WEAN, uh, Women in Entertainment Empowerment Network, which is just crazy insanely wonderful. I mean, she even took time today because they're interviewing hundreds of folks um, that they're plugging into a pipeline that they're developing uh, so that work never ends. 